Uh, I did. Uh, I did want to say this announcement wise today. We do have choir starts at four o'clock. Is that correct, Jerry? Four, four o'clock. Uh, we can always use voices. So if you're interested in in um, you know coming and and hearing or just knowing what the choir is about, uh, we would encourage you to come on out tonight, four o'clock from four to five, um, and uh, join our choir. Uh, thank you. Russ? All right. Thank you, Pastor Randy. My name is Russ Loomis, and I approve of this message. <laughs> Listen, when Pastor Randy uh, asked me to preach uh, this message until uh, entitled this, uh, until then, keep fulfilling the Great Commission, uh, I, honestly, I got pretty excited. Now, I'm going to have to cut back somewhere in here because I forgot that today was uh, the Lord's Supper. And uh, so I, um, I plan on preaching a little longer. So I'm, if you see me, if I throw out a whole page, just because uh, I've got uh, too much material here. But I'm not going to worry about it. I was just told not to worry about it. Lord, was that you? The Great Commission. Keep fulfilling the Great Commission. Um, what is the Great Commission? Well, I, I read this someplace recently. Uh, the Great Commission is the instruction of Jesus Christ to his disciples to spread the gospel to all nations. Uh, now, th those are good words. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty good quote. But there's a better one. And I, I happen, I didn't know the guy who, who, who that quote came from. I didn't know him at all. But I do know who the person is that um, gave us a, a better definition. Uh, his name is Jesus. I know him personally, Amen. and uh, I know many, most of you know him personally. And Jesus said in Matthew uh, chapter 28, uh, starting in verse number 18, the Bible says, and here I'm going to move this thing. Uh, the Bible says, and, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, because I have this power, because I have this authority. He says, Go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the earth, or until the end of the world. And so right there, right there is our, our marching orders, if you will. That is the Great Commission. That's the reason Jesus came down here, uh, not only to live among us, but to die among us. We just, we just participated in the Lord's Supper or Communion. And we remember his, uh, his death. We remember Him hanging on the cross. Um, we remember that He was beaten to a pulp uh, where He was unrecognizable. We remember that because it says that in the Word of God. What I just read to you, this is after the resurrection. So therefore, it's after the crucifixion. So therefore, it's after the beatings and, and being spit upon and being called vulgar names. This is what Jesus went through. Why did he go through that? To pay the penalty for your sins and my sins. That is the reason. That's the reason. I, I said in Sunday school, he, Jesus is the first and really he's the ultimate missionary. Uh, missionaries, uh, I, I know there are home missions, but in my mind, missionaries take the gospel across an ocean someplace, or, or take the gospel someplace far away. Well, he took the gospel far away. He left heaven to come down here to hang around with people like you and me, sinful human beings. That The Great Commission is for us to take what he did and tell that story to other people. Whether here in our hometown, whether someplace in this side of the this side of the country or around the world, uh, that's, that's what we do. We take those verses and we tell people. And Jesus, he says in verse number, uh, number uh, 18, all power is given unto me, or, or all authority is given unto me. Listen, the focus Jesus put on himself, that's what it should be. We should never, doing anything for God, try to put the focus on ourselves. You know, I like to joke around and and say, oh, we're having a special speaker from another state, you know, because I live in Delaware. I, you know what? The focus needs to be on Jesus and Him alone. Amen. 
When Pastor Randy and I, or, or anyone else, stands in this pulpit, uh, we, we don't want the focus on us. We want the focus on Him. Because He deserves the focus. He deserves all the honor and all the glory. And this is, this is the message that we need to uh, give to this, uh, this uh, sinful, dying world that Jesus came to this world to spread the gospel, the good news, I'm going to talk about that in a couple of minutes, to spread the gospel so people could hear the gospel and get saved. That's the good news. Amen. Yeah. Thank you, all of you. Jesus, I want you to understand something, because this is, I, I guarantee you, somebody's going to be here this morning and think, what? What is, what is that? You may not have ever thought about this before. Most of you have. But for you who have not, I want you to understand, Jesus has always been 100% God. There's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. One is not superior to the other one. Uh, that is the Trinity. That's what the Word of God clearly teaches. But on this earth, when He was on this earth, He was still 100% God, and He was 100% man. We can't understand that. We don't... I, there's no way anybody can possibly explain that to you. I certainly cannot explain it to you. But clearly, the Word of God makes it clear that Jesus Christ was 100%, not 50 and 50. That, that would mess everything up if he was only half God and half man. But no, he had to be all God and all man. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. In fact, we're going to talk about that right now. You say, or you think and remember that Jesus wept. Man weeps, mankind. We cry. Why does God, why would God have to cry? Well, that just says that he was also 100% God and 100% man. He wept. Um, he got hungry. He got thirsty. Why would God ever have to get hungry and thirsty? Well, Jesus was God, but he was still man. You know it, it, it often uh, it amazes me during, uh, during, as you're reading the Gospels, especially the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And, you know, there was a feeding of the what? 5,000. Yeah. Uh, he, took, he took a boy's lunch and, and blessed it and broke it. And, and all of a sudden, and that's the, the Bible says 5,000 men. Uh, what about the women and children? There was women and children there too. So who knows really how many thousands of people... He fed that day. This is Jesus Christ, the man. But he was also God. I've never seen a man, a human, man or woman, uh, pray over a small, uh, a small amount of food and then feed thousands of people. Only God can do that. Only Jesus Christ could do that. Uh, Peter couldn't do that. Paul couldn't do that. Listen. Uh, another, uh, Jesus is, uh, because he got hungry and he got thirsty, uh, we think, well, God is self-sufficient, but Jesus became a man. He became a man. He sweated, the Bible says, as it were, great drops of blood the night before he was crucified. He sweated. He, he, was, he was anxious. He was you know what? He said, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Jesus Christ knew what was about to happen to him. He wasn't surprised the next day when, and really that night, when he was dragged before this person and that person. He was judged here and judged here and judged there. This world uh, still judges him. They don't believe. This world does not believe in Jesus Christ. We talked about that a little bit in Sunday school. It's okay to mention God in this world because every religion, I'm putting quotations around that, every religion, they have their God. And, and they also have their, in their religion, well, all I have to do is follow the rules and do good, and do the best I can, and do good works, and help little old ladies across the street, and, and, and you know, give, uh, give food. All I have to do is those things, and at the end of my life, if my good works outweigh my bad works, I'm in. That is absolutely not true. No one has ever gotten into heaven by our good works. 
And we're going we're gonna to read some scripture here in a moment that says you cannot get to heaven by your good works. If, if I could get to heaven by my good works, my right shoulder, my good shoulder would be broken because I'd be patting myself on the back. Look what I did to get into heaven. Well, guess what? I can't get into heaven by my good works and neither can you. There's not one person in heaven who is there after going through a lifetime trying to do good works. It's not there. Religion, and again I, quote, I put quotation, religion, all religions say that we have to do good works, we have to be good, we have to do something to impress God. There's, every religion I know, somebody says, well, but you're, you're a religion, you're a, you're a Baptist. I chose to be a Baptist. I got saved on September 16, 1977, and on that day, I became a born-again Christian. I became a child of God on that day. I'm not religious. The Lord knows I'm not religious. You know, religious people, they, they walk around and, and they make sure that they don't do certain things or think certain things or look at certain things, and, and they, at least they, they, they do those things and they hope not to get caught. Religious people... I'm sorry to break it to you, but if you're depending on your religion to get you to heaven, you're in for a great surprise. You're listening to this message this morning because God wants you to hear the truth from the Word of God. Amen. Not because, not from some religious guy. I already told you, I'm not religious. Far be it from me, I am not a, a religious uh, person. But I understand when people say, oh, you're a pastor, oh, he's, or he's telling them, oh, he's very religious. No, I'm not very religious. Talk to my wife, she'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm not. And so, so why, why would God allow himself to be punched and beaten and whipped beyond recognition and then nailed to a cross? The answer is because Jesus laid aside, if you will, for me for a moment, laid aside his deity and allowed himself to be mocked and beaten and spit upon, and whipped, and nailed to a cross. That's the answer. That's the answer as to why would he do that. Because he had to pay the penalty for your sins. The Bible says, or the song says, you could, uh, he could have called 10,000 angels to get him off of that cross. But if they did get him off that cross before he died, and then that would have ruined all of God's uh, plan for our salvation. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Not my blood, not your blood, but the precious royal blood of Jesus Christ. I say royal. He, the Bible says he is king of kings. That's royalty. And his blood had to be shed. And I know, and this isn't a, an Easter message, but I know for that Satan, for three days, Satan thought he had won the, won the war, won the battle at least, or probably won the war. For three days, he was high-fiving his, you know, wicked angels with him, those demons. And for three days, Satan thought he had won. And then Sunday came. Sunday came. Easter Sunday, we, we refer to it. But we refer, the world refers to Easter Sunday. But we like to say Resurrection Sunday. That was Jesus Christ. That, why am I saying all this? Because the Great Commission is all of these things that I've said. This is, the Great Commission is us going out into the world and telling people about Jesus. That's the Great Commission. Telling people about what he did and what he went through for you and me to be able to go to heaven one day. And, and, and he and Satan has known since that Sunday after the crucifixion that his time is running out. The day is coming where he will be banished to hell for all of eternity. And we all say, yeah, 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 wow, that's great. That's... Listen, if you're here this morning and you're not saved, I wouldn't say, yeah, 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 yes. Because if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you're going to follow him. Pastor Russ, how can you say that? I am a good person. You know what? I, I mean this respectfully and, and seriously, though. Hell is full of good people. Pastor Russ, how can you say that? I'll say it again. Hell is full of good people. Good people oftentimes 
I've already said it. This is like beating a dead horse now because I've said it so many times. But good people try to get to heaven by their good works. Yeah. When I die, I, I, I know where I'm going to go because I've done really good. And, uh, and, uh, and I'm telling you today, that is a lie from Satan himself. You are not going to end up going to heaven for all of eternity until you ask Jesus Christ to be your Savior. And until and it's not just a prayer, oh, Jesus, please be my Savior. You know, there's something that the Holy Spirit of God has to do in your heart before you even pray that prayer. Because if you pray that prayer just flippantly, um, nothing's going to change. When somebody prays a prayer of salvation, like the... Uh, uh, who am I trying to think of, uh, just came to me. In fact, this morning, I told my wife this morning, I, I, was, I was laying in bed before I even, I, was, I wasn't even hardly awake yet. And in Luke chapter 18, I promise you, I wrote it. It's right here. I wrote it this morning. It says this in, in Luke chapter 18. It's about the, it's about the Pharisee and the, and the tax collector. And they were standing there. And the Pharisee saying, I, I did this and I do this and I give here and I do this. And six times he says the word I. And in the same passage, the Bible says that, that uh, the, uh, uh, the tax collector stood there and wouldn't even, put his, wouldn't even put his head up. And stood there and just said, he beat on his chest, the Bible says, and said, Be merciful unto me, a sinner. That's what God wants to hear from people. People tell me all the time, hey, Russ, uh, I, I, people that don't know the Lord Jesus as Savior, hey, Russ, I've been praying for you. I've been praying for you. Uh, I had hip surgery a couple months ago. So there's, there's some people, and I appreciate their, their well-meaning, their, their well-meaningness, if you can say that, if that's a word. I appreciate that. But I believe with all my heart that the first prayer that God hears from anyone is, Lord, be merciful unto me, a sinner. When we, when we just admit, you know what, I, I'm not a good person. I am a sinful human being just like the 8 billion other, uh, others of us who uh, are walking this earth. Uh, I, I am a sinner. Uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus says in, um, uh, uh, no, wait, wait. You see, I'm, I'm going so fast trying to get through this. Now I've got I to gotta take a deep breath. All right, let's go. For all of eternity... Satan will be there. But listen, um, I want you to understand something. Jesus is never going to have to humble himself. He humbled himself as a man, the Bible says. And that's why he, he, was, he allowed himself to be beaten and spit upon and, and cussed and, and uh, nailed to a cross. But uh, the, the day, the day is, is coming. In fact, the day is already here. But he'll never have to humble himself again. He will never have to ride on the back of a donkey again. Think about that. Think about that at Easter time when you're in your Bible and you start reading and he rode. I mean, talk about humility. Jesus rode the back of a donkey. The Bible says he's going to come back one day on the back of a big white horse, powerful horse. He's done with donkeys. He's done with, with humbling himself. Uh, the Bible refers to him as the Lamb of God, but one day he is going to return to this earth as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. You know what? Wh which are you more afraid of, lions or lambs? Oh, oh my goodness, lambs! Oh, they could they could bite your ankles. Uh, no, 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 no. Jesus is likened, if you will, is painted the picture of a lion. I, that is my favorite animal. My wife will tell you, my five-year-old baby girl will tell you, or her big brother, uh, they'll tell you, uh, 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 Grandpa, his favorite, uh, his favorite animal is a lion. We were over in Africa, <laughs> Man, I'll tell you what, and we saw some sometimes, and they're, they're so big, and they're so powerful, and they're not afraid of anybody or anything. And I'll tell you what, there's a reason why the Word of God says that Jesus will come back as a lion of the tribe of Judah. He's not going to come back riding on a donkey. He is all-powerful. This is the message that we need to give to the unsaved world. Jesus, Roman, or, uh, Matthew 28, 18, all power is given unto me, he said. There is no one like... 
there's a song, and I can't think of how to, it's been too many years since we were in Zambia, but there's a song that, that we sing over in Zambia. In English, it's, there's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like Him. And then we sing it, in fact, I'm just getting, ah, uh, the thought of singing with those, those people in the church in Zambia. It's just incredible. But there is no one like Him. I don't care what language you sing it in, there's no one like Jesus. There, there is, there is a, no one like our, our powerful Savior. Uh, verse number 19 says, Go ye. So he says, All power is given unto me. And because of that, I'm telling you, go. You've trusted me as your Savior. Now I want you to go. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Jesus said, you know what, to, to the 11 disciples, and one of them was, uh, was gone. Judas, by this time, had committed suicide uh, over the horrible thing that he, he had uh, done. And so now there's the 11 uh, disciples. And, and uh, Jesus tells them, uh, because I'm all-powerful and you're followers of me, I'm telling you, go. Go, therefore, and, 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 and preach and teach and baptize uh, all, all in the name of the, the, the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost. He wants us to bring this world the message of the gospel of the good news. You say, no, wait a minute, what, what's the good news? For God so loved the world. I challenge everybody in our Sunday school class, if you don't know that verse, you need to learn that verse. It's not hard to learn. You can learn it, get yourself a 3 by 5 card, or at least that's what I used to use 100 years ago. However you want to do it, but get something and learn John 3.16. This world needs to know, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the Gospel. The next verse says, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. That's the Gospel. That's what we need. Jesus came to seek and to save those who are lost. Guess what? That would be you and that would be me. That's the good news. That's the message that the disciples were told to teach this sinful, sinful world in which we live. This world needs to know that in Romans, God says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. Uh, in, in the original Greek, the word all means all. Yeah. You don't have to be a Greek scholar to figure that one out. All have sinned. Not everybody except you or everybody, you know. Uh, it, it, all, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous. Ah, righteous, righteous, righteousness, right? Good, good works. Good. Yeah, uh, there we go, there we go. Okay, we can't get to heaven by our good works. But listen, it, it, there's a bunch of Bible verses here. I'm going to read these if, if I'm the only one left here. Uh, I'm, I'm going to read these. <laughs> Listen, there's, no, there's none righteous, no, not one. It further goes on to say what the problem is about all that. The wages of sin is death. Listen, you at the end of your week, you get wages. You know, somebody's going to put a check in your hand or, or cash maybe or something. Uh, if they're not putting those things in your hand, you need to move someplace else where they're going to pay you. But wages is something that you've earned. Something that I've earned. And it says in that verse in Romans, uh, the, the wages of sin is death, but, ding, 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 but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus, His death, that is an offering for you and me to come to Christ. It is a gift. You do not deserve. I do not deserve. You cannot pay for. I cannot pay for. You cannot earn, I cannot earn, salvation. Salvation is a gift. Right, Ty? Yes, yeah. It is, it is a gift. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, the good news is not, uh, is not that you and I are sinners, but, but part of the good news is knowing, 
that you and I are sinners. You know, if you talk to somebody who doesn't know they're a sinner and won't admit they're a sinner, well, there's an issue right there. Because God says, you are a sinner. I am a sinner. And now we can do something about it. Well, what can we do about it? I'm glad you asked. You know, uh, repentance is a big part of salvation. Repentance. The Bible says that John the Baptist, who was Jesus' forerunner, he's the one who introduced Jesus to his public ministry. The, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I think Pastor Randy just said that a few minutes ago. Uh, but John the Baptist, his, uh, uh, his message to the world was, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, for the kingdom of... Not try to do better, uh, clean up your act, Stop drinking, stop smoking, stop running around doing things you shouldn't be doing. Stop doing these things. It doesn't say that at all. It just says, repent. Now, repent. What is repentance? Well, repentance is, I'm going this way for my whole life. And for me, it was 24 years. I was going this way. And on September 16, 1977, I fell on my face before God. And I repented of my sins. And I asked God to, for, to forgive me. And I asked Jesus Christ to be my Savior and come into my heart. And repentance is turning around and going the opposite way. Amen. Yeah, that's repentance. And, and so John the Baptist, he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Guess what? The first thing out of Jesus' mouth, the very next chapter in Matthew says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The exact words that John the Baptist had said just recently. Repent and believe the gospel. Repentance. So there's repentance and there's faith. And in, in Acts chapter 20 verse 21, Acts 20 verse 21, the Bible says testifying both to the Jews and also the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. There it is. There it is right there. Somebody says, oh, I don't think I need to repent. Well, you need to. Because that's what the Word of God says. Testifying both to the Jews and also the Greeks or the, the Gentiles. If you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. And today, same thing. If you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. There's so much more. There's so much more. Some people focus on the love of God. Well, God, you know, He just, God is love. And so He's just going to have to accept me the way I am. No, he's not. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's not the way it works. He's, I say, I say this respectfully. I, I say this reverently. He's the boss. You're not. I'm not. He's the one that made the rules. Not you, not me. You know what? All he wants you to do, if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as your Savior, he wants you to accept what his son already did for you. Because you and me, we can't do it on our own. We can't do it. Try as you might, you cannot do it. You cannot save yourself. The Bible says in, in uh, Ephesians, uh, for by grace are you saved, for by grace. Now, we already know it's a gift. Salvation is a gift. We just read that. And then in Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 8 and 9, uh, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, God will even give you the faith. So, well, I'm the one that, when I got saved, I'm the one, no, 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 no. He's given everything. The Bible says he gave, he gave his love, he sent his son, he gave grace, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is a gift. There we go again. It is a gift. Those two verses, the one I read a few minutes ago and the one I just read right now, salvation is a gift. You can't get around it. You can't say, I'll get it on my own. It won't work. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And then, then Paul says over in another, in, in Titus, another book of the Bible, he says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his what? Mercy. So now we've got God's love, God's grace, God's mercy. It's like he did everything. Yeah, he did. He did everything. Grace and mercy are not giving you something that you do deserve, not giving you something you do deserve, uh, which we deserve hell. And mercy, mercy takes care of that. And grace is giving you something 
or, uh, giving you something that you don't deserve. That's grace. Do I think for one second that I deserve to go to heaven? No. Do I think for one second that, that uh, what I think about Jesus Christ dying on the cross for my sins? Ah, he didn't have to do that. Yeah, he did. God's love, God gives us a faith, God's grace, God's mercy, the gift of God is eternal life. I want to focus on the Holy Spirit in the, in the five minutes that I don't have left. Uh, the, the, the title of the message is, Until Then, Keep Fulfilling the Great Commission. Um, how do we do such a, how do we fulfill the Great Commission? Well, I'm glad you asked, because the end of, the end of Matthew runs right into the beginning of Acts. It's the same, it's during the same time when Jesus is telling the disciples to go, and the disciples are looking at him with like the deer in the headlight look. Okay, go, but well, how do we, whoa, hold on, how do we do this? How do we do this? And Jesus tells them in Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8, he says, but ye shall receive, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea, uh, Judea and in Samaria and into the uttermost parts of the earth. In other words, at the same time, your, your, your Jerusalem, this is our Jerusalem, right here in our church and in this area in Chester and Brookhaven and in this area right here. And then in, in uh, Judea, you know, the, the, this whole uh, northeast, if you will. And then in Samaria, maybe the whole of the United States, and then unto the uttermost parts of the earth. That means in the original Greek, unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Take the gospel everywhere. We talked about that in, in Sunday school this morning. I have a book. It's called The Insanity of God. Best book I've ever read in my entire life. Sounds awful. What? Some of you are grabbing your hearts right now. He didn't say what he said, did he? Yeah, it is. It, it's an incredible book. Um... But this man took the gospel to Somaliland, and it's, it's unbelievable uh, what he went through. But listen, the gospel has been taken to the uttermost parts of the earth since Jesus' day. Listen, in, in Acts, and I, I can't even think where it is right now, if it's in Acts chapter 1 or 2, I can't think where it is, it doesn't matter. But, but the church came under fire, and the, the church started being persecuted, and the disciples went in ten different directions with the gospel. That was all part of God's plan for them to suffer persecution so he could get them off their backside and out into the uttermost parts of the world to take the gospel of Jesus Christ. We support missionaries in this church. We support missionaries who are all over the world. They're all over the world. And they're taking the gospel. Listen, uh, the, the Great Commission didn't stop after the original disciples. It didn't stop. No, every generation since then has had their own Great Commission. Same, same words, same message, same everything, although we, well, not same everything because now we have planes and they didn't back then. Now we have cell phones. I can get on a cell phone and call Zambia and, and it'll take a few seconds we have all kinds of things. The problem is we're using all these things that we have right now as toys. And we're, we're bettering our own lives and, and, and instead of focusing on spreading the gospel into the whole world. So how do we fulfill our great commission? I just read it to you. But ye shall receive power. Listen, the Bible says that when you and I get, got saved or get saved, um, the Bible says, in fact, in, in the first, uh, uh, first Corinthians uh, chapter 6 and verse 19. The Bible says what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Wait, hold, time out. Time out. What do you mean my body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Well, that means that the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit of God, dwells within us. The moment we get saved, the Holy Spirit of God comes and dwells within us. That's how you know when you, when you sin, if you're not immediately convicted in your heart by the sin, whatever it might have been, whatever it been, if it was something out of your mouth or looking at something you shouldn't have looked at or getting angry at somebody that you shouldn't have gotten angry at or whatever it might be, uh, the Holy Spirit of God immediately convicts the heart of the, of the Christian, of the born-again Christian because the Holy Spirit is the one who lives within us. 
and He can convict our heart, and then we, we take care of that. We confess our sin, we ask God to forgive us, and we try not to do the same thing over again. But he says, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God? You're not your own. You're bought with a price. I wish I could stay there for a while. That's a whole message in itself. Your body, we, we live in this time, and man, oh man, I've I got to be careful right here because I don't want to end on a... We live in this time where we are told that everybody's body is their own body and we can do whatever we want with our body. And I'm telling you from the Word of God, that is not the truth. Not, not for the Christian anyway. Amen. Not for the born-again Christian. Amen. Our body is not our own. That's what the Word of God says. I'm, look it up yourself. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and verse number 19. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. What was that price? The shed blood of Jesus. That was a pretty hefty price price to pay. So how important is the Holy Spirit concerning the Great Commission? Well, how, is, how important is breathing to you? you? There would be no Great Commission without the Spirit of God. There would be no... Uh, the people, people hear the Word of God, they get saved, they get in a church, they grow, they learn, they learn about giving, they learn about um, fellowshipping, they learn about all about Jesus from the from the, the Gospels, and they learn all these different things, and then they hear about the Great Commission, they hear about missions, they hear about missionaries, and all of a sudden, God starts knocking at their heart's door. You know what? I want you to go. I want you to go to Mogadishu. I want you to go to Taiwan. I want you to go to Zambia. I want you to go to Russia. I want you to go to Mexico. And that's how we get missionaries all over this world. Because people are now, they're tuned in to the Word of God, and they're tuned in to the Spirit of God, and when the Spirit of God says, you know what, I, I want you to go. We only have, I want to remind you, we only have two choices, folks. We either pray and give, or pray and go. That's it. There is no, you say, well, I'm not praying or giving. Okay, well, don't tell me about that. You, know, you, you take that up with God. God tells, God tells us that we need to either give or go. And if you're not giving and you're not going, I challenge you today, talk to God about that. I'm not being sarcastic. I'm not being funny. Talk to God about that. Lord, um, what, what do you want me to do? Some would say, you know what? I can't be a part of the Great Commission. I'm not even saved. Well, that is a, that is a pretty big uh, detail. That is. Um, why would you even want to be a part of the Great Commission if you're not saved? I challenge you again today, if you're not saved, you need to be saved. What is, what is being saved? Well, I mentioned a couple times, but I'm going to mention one more time. That is, hearing the Word of God. The Bible says faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Okay, I, I heard the Word of God this morning, and now I realize for the first time in my life, I'm not saved. What do I do about that? Well, you, you don't have to literally kneel down. I did all those years ago. But standing up and kneeling down, kneeling down is just a form of humility. And so, so that's what a lot of people do. But confess, you, Lord, I, please forgive me of all of my sins. Please forgive me of all of my... I've spent 24 years or 48 years or 67 years, all, however old you are, and I never realized that I was not saved. Until this guy just preaches the word of God and tells me now that I'm saved. Uh, listen, God is not willing that any should perish. God is not willing that any should perish. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, He doesn't want anyone to die and go to hell. That's not His will. His will is that everyone gets saved. The problem is too many people push it off and push it off and say, You know what, I'm not interested. And then when they're on their deathbed, like my, not, like my next door neighbor, when I was growing up, uh, her name was Lucille. And when I got saved, I was so pumped. I was, so, I was a prison guard at the time in upstate New York. And I came home on my days off, and I went right over to Lucille and Ed. And Ed was, I don't know where Ed was, but Lucille, I can remember like it happened yesterday. I sat there and told her about Jesus Christ. I sat there and told her how to get saved. She was religious. And she looked at me with that condescending look. Oh, Rusty. 
Rusty, I'm happy for you. Oh. And then guess what? A couple years later, I get a phone call from my sister. Russ, Lucille just died. And I almost died. I, I thought that conversation that came up in her kitchen, and then my sister tells me that just before Lucille died, she turned to her husband as she was in a hospital bed. She said, Ed, I'm afraid because I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> Folks, listen to me. If you're here this morning or you're, you're, you're listening on, online right now, don't put yourself, don't allow yourself to get to be put in that situation. God is not willing that you or anyone else should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All she needed to do was call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and repent of her sins, and she would have been saved just like that. And yet she died and went out into eternity. Folks, if you're here this morning and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I would just, I would just ask you this morning, what, why? Why not get saved? Why not get saved today? Why not get saved right now? You can. You can. I wonder if you would just, everyone, just please bow your head and close your eyes. With every head bowed and every eye closed and no one looking around. The title of the message is, Until Then... We need to fulfill the Great Commission. Folks, part of that Great Commission is sitting right here today. If you're here this morning and you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you to stand up. I'm not going to do anything to you other than if you're here this morning and you know you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior and you want to be saved today, would you just slip your hand up and right back down so I can pray for you? That's, I promise you that's all I'm going to do. Just slip your hand up and right back down. Thank you. Thank you for your honesty. God bless you. Thank you. Anyone else all over the auditorium? Pastor Russ, I'm, I'm not saved today. I don't know. If I was to die, if I was to leave this building and get hit by a car, I don't know where I'd go. Again, just slip your hand up and right back down. I'll see your hand. Um, Christian, you're here this morning. You're saying... Well, I, I, I'm saved. I know I'm saved. But I've never really thought about the Great Commission. I've really never thought about being a part of the Great Commission. I mean, we give our money to this church, and I know that missionaries are supported by our church. And, but the Great Commission itself, I, I don't know. I've never really thought about that before. I've never really gone out and uh, witnessed to people how they can get saved. Because the Great Commission is for here, too. It's not just across the ocean. You say, Pastor, would you just pray for me so I can be more of a part of the Great Commission? Just slip your hand up and right back down. Thank you. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you. Hand, yes, many hands went up. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Would you stand with me as we go to the Lord in prayer? God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you, Father, for the Great Commission. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, that you put in your word uh, exactly what happened and exactly what needs to happen for someone to get saved. Lord, it's a, it's a, a, a great thing to be a part of a, a winning team and it's, it's a, or, or a great thing to be a part of a, a business or a company or even a God-blessed church, but uh, there, there's, nothing, there's nothing like being part of the family of God. There's nothing like being part of the Great Commission that, the heartbeat of God. And Lord, I just pray that everyone here is in a different situation, but I pray for those who raise their hand and say, listen, I'm not saved, and I want to get saved, even today. I pray that I'm going to step down from this pulpit in just a moment, and I just pray that if anyone wants to come forward, and, and I, so I have Pastor Randy or somebody can talk to them about how they can be saved. Help them, Lord, not to be embarrassed about it. It happens all the time. Help them, Father, to realize, literally, they're a heartbeat away from going out into eternity. So bless them, Father. And those of my brothers and sisters in Christ who raise their hand, help them, Lord, to be uh, just not afraid to or, or more bold or uh, whatever it might be, Lord, that's holding them back. Help them to be a part of the Great Commission. Thank you for all that you do for us, Father. Thank you for your precious word. 
I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.